Today, I want to speak to you about God being more than enough to deliver, more than enough. I know you're doing a series here about God being more than enough, and it's not just more than enough for your own personal needs, but it's more than enough for the church. It's more than enough for America. It's more than enough for the world around us. God has no insufficiencies. He has no lack of power. He has no lack of authority. He has no lack of wisdom. He has no lack of understanding. He has no lack of mercy. He has no lack of grace. And I guess I could say it more simply, he lacks nothing. Amen? He lacks nothing. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus you would speak to us. Lord, let your word be living today. Let your power come forth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Turn with me in your scriptures, if you would, to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 8. All right, somebody's happy to see each other there. <laughs> All right, keep, keep your focus here if you would. Let's go ahead and t- turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. More than enough for deliverance. Verse 8, for we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despised of life itself. Indeed, we felt that he had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessings granted us through the prayers of many. Paul is saying here, I have been delivered. How many of you could agree with him? I have been delivered. Lord, I thank you that I have been delivered. I have been delivered from fear. I've been delivered when I was a young man from pornography. I've been delivered from selfishness. I've been delivered from hopelessness. Many of you in this room have been greatly delivered by things that have troubled your soul. You have seen your family delivered. You've seen your marriage delivered. You've seen your finances, the crisis in your finances. You've been delivered. You've been set free. One more time. Can somebody say amen to say, thank God that he has delivered me from the things of my past. It's interesting that Paul says, you have delivered me, and you are delivering me. Now he's moving into a present tense. In other words, he's in a situation now saying, okay, I can count on you because you've delivered me in the past, so now I can count on you that right now in my present circumstance, and he begins to describe that in the scripture, his present circumstance is once again troubled. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's not enough that he was just delivered from things of his past, but now he's saying these, these things have reoccurred. How many of you found that sometimes problems reoccur in your life? Yeah. How, how many times, don't you wish you were just delivered from things in your past and you don't have to be delivered anymore? Right. That you don't have any more financial problems, physical problems, marriage problems, children problems, neighbor problems, self, uh, things in your own mind, mental problems that you're facing in your life. But Paul's saying, here I find myself once again in, in dilemma, and he described he was so burdened, utterly burdened beyond his own strength that he'd just step there and say, you know, I, I've been in trouble and I'm in trouble again and I need delivered again and I'm, I'm despairing of life almost to the point where I'm kind of getting depressed here, maybe a little even suicidal, I think. I don't know. I'm despairing even to the point of my life. It's not a peppy message. There is a church. But he's honestly facing the crisis that he f- has found himself in because he'd received the sentence of death that... And there was a purpose for that we're going to talk about in just a moment. It's it's not that he just has this one-time thought of something difficult in his life. He he lives this kind of life. If you turn to chapter 6 and verse 4, but as your servants of God, we commend ourselves. Now this idea, he's, I'm a servant of God. Here's, Here's what my service looks like. And I'm commending myself. In other words, there's, if, if I'm going to give myself any kind of reward of, of understanding about my life and ministry, here's what it is. By great endurance and afflictions and hardships and calamities and beatings and imprisonments and in riots, sleepless nights and in hunger. How many of you would want to put that up on your wall next to the graduation <laughs> plaque that you have up there? Here's my commendation. Here's the rewards. Here's the trophies I've won. It's the beatings on my back. It's the sufferings that I've endured. It's, it's the sleepless nights. And in another chapter, I won't take the time to turn there, but he talks about being beaten on his back, being shipwrecked, spending the night, uh, overnight in the waters in the sea. This is, this is a man who has faced great hardships. And he gives a reason for this now. But let me just look at verse 10 one more time. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. 
And then he will deliver us from our present circumstances. There's a hope in Paul. He knows everything he's been through, God's delivered him out of it. And now he's saying, and what I'm in now, I'm going to be delivered from. But he goes on and says one more thing. Um, On whom we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. That's good news. But it's also bad news. I know it's an exciting news because we're, we're trusting he's going to deliver us again. But the bad news is that if he's going to have to deliver us again, we're going to get in trouble again. And, and this sounds really exciting if you look at it from a positive perspective. But before it's positive, it, you have to go through a little bit of trouble. Uh, I, I've been in trouble and you've set me free. And now I find myself today in trouble and you're going to set me free. And most likely I'm going to be in trouble tomorrow. Most likely, I'm going to be suffering again tomorrow. Most likely, I'm going to be in hardship tomorrow. This is not a message many churches in America want to preach any longer. They they don't want to honestly tell their people. And that's why people are not prepared for suffering. They're not prepared for hard times. That's why we have many lukewarm Christians, half-hearted Christians, backslidden Christians, Christians who will give up at the first moment of trouble. They'll get angry at God instantaneously if they don't answer instantaneously every single little prayer that they've ever had. And there's a frustration with them. There's a sense of the gospel doesn't work. Jesus doesn't work. Well, Jesus does work, but maybe not always the way you want him to. But he is one who has delivered you. He is one who is delivering you. And he is one who will deliver you from all of your troubles. Why, why does God defer this deliverance? Because he's more than enough and he has enough power and enough authority and enough love, enough compassion. Why does he put you through circumstances where you've been in trouble, that you are in trouble, and that you might find more trouble and difficulty in the future. Why, doesn't he, why does he defer his delay of deliverance? Why didn't he, Paul just snap his finger and say, I was delivered when I got saved, and I have not had a difficult day since. Why does God allow difficulty? Why does he defer the deliverance from that difficulty? Why does he bring and allow more difficulty in our future? Paul says it so clearly here in verse 11, uh, the end of verse uh, 10 and then into 11 uh, verse 10 he has delivered us uh, excuse me, let's, uh, sorry back up to 9 verse 9 indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely that okay look at that word for a second that was to in other words Paul saying there is a purpose and, 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 and this purpose is not just sort of the devil's purpose for my life he doesn't say and the devil did this to me and uh, certainly the evil one is involved in much of our suffering and much of the pain and sorrows and, and certainly the trials and temptations that we go through have the hand of the element of the hand of this satanic work in them but but how many of you know God is bigger than Satan how many of you know that God is omnipotent and Satan is a, a, a single created being and there, there's no comparison it's not like one, you know, God on one shoulder like the good angel and Satan on your other shoulder like a bad angel and they're fighting it out equally. There's nothing equal about it. Nothing at all. And, and so, so Paul understands that, that God had created a purpose for his difficulty and his suffering, he says, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves. When you have a difficulty and it's beyond your control, when it's, when, when it's just too much for you to handle, when you're just overwhelmed, when you're crying out like King David did, oh Lord, how long, how long, oh Lord, how long, and you just feel this, this delayed, this deferring of the deliverance, Lord, do you not hear my cry? Where are you when my soul is in anguish and suffering? Where are you when I'm in this pain? And Paul, through that all, comes to a conclusion that I hope you and I as a church today come to this very same conclusion that we could say, but that thing was from God to make us rely not on ourselves. We're not going to rely on our own strength. We're not going to rely on our own wisdom. We're not going to rely on our own power. We're not going to rely on our own resources. We're not going to rely on our flesh. We're not going to rely on our money. We're not going to rely on our cleverness, our ingenuity, our own skill. God shows the weakness of our own strength so that we could see the power of his strength. We won't rely on ourselves, uh, but, but he doesn't stop there. We're not going to, it's not just he's going to empty himself on self-reliance or self-confidence. He, he's going to do something else here. He's going to say, it's not just a, a, a deadness to myself, but it's a living to God. Uh, the, not to rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He's speaking here of circumstances that are beyond what we would think is even deliverable. 
the woman who touched the hem of his garment had a delayed and uh, deferred deliverance, 14 years of the issue of blood, and she had spent everything she had. She had nothing left to rely on herself, but she could see this thing that Paul sees, but on God who raises the dead. Mary and Martha, after their brother, Jesus, uh, their brother Lazarus had died, had nothing left of their own resources, their own strength, their medical uh, relationships that they might have had, their money to spend on trying to get him the best medical care. Nothing was left except to rely not on themselves, but on God who raises the dead. What problem have you been delivered from? What crisis are you finding yourself in now? And what might happen to you? What you, what you might fear in the future? God is showing you that you cannot rely on yourself for any of those things. So there's no need to spend restless nights tossing and turning in your bed, trying to figure out in your own intellect how you can solve these problems. Rely on the power of God who raised raises the dead. He raises, he raises dead children back to life. He raises dead marriages back to life. He raises cold hearts back to the furious flame and fire of God. He rescues dead churches to come back to life. And I would even suggest to you, he takes dead nations who are godless, in peril, suffering from all kinds of gross immorality, and he raises them back up to life. I, I believe there's deliverance not only for people, families, churches, but even for nations that God wants to raise, bring resurrection life to these things so that you're not relying on yourself. <clears throat> I believe that God wants to resurrect America. Uh, I, I believe America is in a, in a near hopeless situation. We find ourselves in difficulty. We are in spiritual bankruptcy. We are in moral depravity. We are in sexual perversity. We are in family insecurity. We are in national animosity towards one another. We are in emotional immaturity. We are in governmental insanity. We are in biblical illiteracy. We are in doctrinal impurity. We are in testimonial in the church, some testimonial in inconsistency. And oftentimes in the church, there is much preaching frivolity. But in the midst of that, it's not hopeless. It's not over. I'm troubled over the church. I, I sometimes feel like Lot... When the Bible says his soul was vexed, he was grieved in soul over sinful Sodom. And I believe the condition of the nation of America today is not very far different from Sodom and Gomorrah. If, if you were to take it in scale, we would probably not be in any worse condition. Or in, in Jesus' situation or the apostles' situation in the first century Rome, they were in a perverse culture. They were among government leaders who were so far from God, it, it was off the charts, radically different from anything moral, anything substantially of, of the things of God. And yet they were able to thrive in those circumstances, thrive in those situations. They did not give up hope. I believe we in America today are very similar to the condition of, of the time of Eli and his sons, Hopnes and Phineas, who were, were wicked sons. They were, they were in the priesthood in the church. And there, there's, 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 when, when there's wickedness in the pulpit, what, what, what hope does the nation have for deliverance? And, and, and Hopney and Phineas, they, 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 they had the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. Follow me just for a minute, if you would. It's not in my text, but follow me. Hopney and Phineas were the priest in a, in a time where they were fighting against, the, I believe it was the Philistines, and then they had uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God. The presence of God was in Israel. And, and many people today are rejoicing over the presence of God in the church. And now, now follow me here for just a minute. But what they describe as the presence of God is their emotional movements, like, ooh, that was a good song. Ooh, that was peppy preaching. Ooh, we had some amazing fellowship. Oh, the lights and the smoke and the videos, all that's, oh, I felt moved by God. And they, they consider that the presence of God. That's no more the, the presence of God than those who danced around the idol when Moses was up on the mountain. They had cast their own golden calf and they sang, sang songs and they danced and they celebrated and they thought they were in the presence presence of something that was worshiping God. They didn't say, we're going to worship an idol. They put up an idol that was representing what they thought was their God. We're doing that in the church today, and we're saying we have the presence of God. Well, if they had the presence of God, why were they being defeated? Because they thought they had the presence of God, but they also had the presence of sin. 
Hopney and Phineas were taking, taking uh, some of the, the meat that was offered to the presence of God, and they were eating it for themselves, and they were having sexual immorality with the young women who came to, to, to worship the Lord, and, and this was an abomination before the Lord. So you can't have the presence of God and sin in the camp and still have victory. And, and so we're having, we're having, in America today, we're having the, the, what we call the presence of God, but, but it's a mixture with sin. We're tolerating sin in the church. That was the problem with Eli. The Bible says in 1 Samuel that Eli did not confront his children. He, he, he didn't speak to them about their issues, and therefore he tolerated it. He let it go, and, and this caused And so at the end of it, now, now, there's a lot, if you've ever studied or heard preaching about Eli, he, he sort of gets a bad name. But one thing he did right, when the, when the Ark of the Covenant was taken into battle and it was taken over by the enemies, and he felt like the presence of God was gone. Now, now we still have the sin in the camp, but now we also have the presence gone. Now we have almost nothing left. If you ever needed deliverance as a nation, that's the time you needed deliverance. And one thing Eli did right, it says he sat there in his seat And he watched, and he waited, and he trembled in heart for the presence of the Lord, for the ark of the Lord. We need men and women from this church and churches all across our nation that tremble for the presence of God once again to be restored to America. That once again, holiness would come into our nation, our nation's leadership. That once again, we would say, God, there's hope. And, you know, and here's, you know, sometimes I get a little negative, and sometimes I get a little bit down, and I'm saying, like, you know, America's hopeless. It's judgment. It's, the game's over. It's all, you know, just, just call it quits, you know. Let's, let's move to Canada or something. Not that it's any better up there. But, but I get a little bit of a negative thing. But then I start reading the Scripture, and all of a sudden, my heart is filled with hope again. He has delivered us in the past and, and, and Paul could be speaking, yes, to individuals and to churches, but he's speaking to, uh, to, to nations as well. He has delivered us. He will, he's delivering us now, and he will deliver us in the future as well. And even Eli and all of his suffering and sorrow, and he ends up dying very rapidly right after the circumstances. But, but while he is, is mourning the lack of the presence of God, while he's mourning that, you know what's happening? God is raising up a young Samuel. And, and, and a revival happens in Israel, a spiritual awakening. I believe that God can deliver America. I believe God can change our circumstances. I believe God can do a spiritual awakening. I believe the sexual perversity can be reversed. I believe holiness can be restored. And I'm running out of time here, but also, not only in America, but I believe in the church as well. Uh, I believe God is about to sweep through his church and cause there, first of all, to be a mighty move of God in this pulpit. Men of God who stand in this pulpit are going to be transformed. They're going to fall on their knees before God and cry out, Lord, I've been foolish. No, no, Lord, I don't want to stand up here and be a Sigmund Freud or an Oprah Winfrey. And I don't want my worship team to be American Idol, you know, or... America's got talent. This is not a show. And I think some young pastors are getting a stirring of their heart and saying, enough with the show, enough with the entertainment, enough of the foolishness, enough of the frivolity. Right now it's time to stand up here in this pulpit, in this church, in this nation, and say, thus saith the Lord. Have a word from God. Have a holy, sober, sovereign, powerful, anointed word from God that breaks the yoke, that sets hearts free, that delivers a word from God, that the word of God that delivers you and me from our crisis that we find ourselves in. God is going to revive his church. He's not going to leave it. He, it may take some time should he tarry, but when he, but when he comes in his power, he's going to do a great work. And lastly, he's going to do a, a deliverance inside of you and I. And this may sound like, okay, now you got to the easy part. No, now I got to the hard part. Because the hardest thing that God has to change is not nations or churches, it's you. Sorry, that sounded kind of rude. Let me, let me say it a little nicer. The harder thing God has to change is me. I'm the problem. I'm the problem. I'm, I'm, I'm the problem in the church. Because if I was not the problem in the church, then when I stood up here to speak, there would be such power and anointing and deliverance that it would set the captives free. But I don't have that kind of power. I don't have that kind of anointing. It's me. I have, there's something wrong in me. I want more. I need more of Jesus. I need more of his anointing touch on my life. I need more of that, that Holy Spirit anointing that sets the captives free, that breaks the yoke, that, that, that del- brings deliverance, that, that, that's a word in season, that's instant, it's powerful, it's, it's thorough, 
It has God all over it. I, and, and it's me. It's, it's me for the church. And it's me for the nation. The nation, is, the nation is corrupt in the way that it is. And the politicians we have, we have because of who we are as people. And we have to, have to ask God, change me first, God. It's easy to listen to Fox News and start blaming the Democrats or start blaming the Republicans or start blaming this person or start blaming that person. But the finger has to point in first and say, God, change my heart and the longest form of deliverance. He did it in the past, he's doing it now, and he's going to do it in the future. And, and he can change a nation instantaneously, and he can change a church and revive it overnight. But the work he's doing in you and me, it's going to be for the rest of our lives. The longest process of deliverance God ever does is in a human soul, because it lasts till the very last breath that you have. When my father died when he was 78, he was still being discipled and nurtured and transformed by the Lord. It's a long-term process, and you have to release yourself to the Holy Spirit's power and say, God, I need it now. Stand with a few at church, and we're going to pray for deliverance right here today. We're going to pray that God will set you free from the things of your past, from the things you're suffering right now, and from the things that you will have. In hearing what I've had to say today, we pray for America, we pray for the church, but Lord, touch my heart. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, would you, would you say, Pastor Gary, I, I, I find myself in a place of difficulty. I find myself in a place of a need for deliverance. And, 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 and sometimes it just gets too much to bear. When, when I think of the past problems I've had, and some of them are still present to me, and I begin to wonder, where are you, God? If you are in that place of suffering and difficulty right now, and maybe you don't even know Jesus today. You're, you're, you're doing all this on your own. So you don't, you don't even have the capacity like Paul to say this. You, have, you, you are setting me free from my self-confidence. And you're, bringing, you're becoming the God who delivers even from death, the resurrection from death. And you need to be resurrected from spiritual death. I want to pray for you as well. And, and, and if you don't know Jesus today or if you do know him and you're in a painful time in your life, Oh, I wish I had time just to speak to each of you one-on-one. -on -one. You're in that painful time of life. I just want you to slip up a hand right now. I want to pray for you. I want to, put, I want to put new hope in your heart. No circumstances is beyond the Lord's power to deliver you from past, present, or future. God is your God. God is in control, and God loves you. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that, that anyone who's captive to things in their own heart that need to change, you would change them. Lord, for circumstances that need to change, you would change them, God. You would deliver and set captives free. Lord, you would, you would help families. Lord, deliver families. Deliver people from crisis in their life. And I pray over people who are emotionally troubled here today. God, they're, they're burdened. There's a heaviness upon them. Oh, Holy Spirit, resurrect life in them right now, God, so that they learn that they cannot be dependent on their own sources or resources, but they're dependent on you. Thank you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, lastly, I pray for anyone who who most wonderfully walked into this building today and they, they came in not having a relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Christ, the Savior of the world who, take, who took away the sins of the world and made a people who were unholy, righteous and filled with life. And you can have that today. And I pray over you right now that you would just simply say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sin. Make me a whole new person. Welcome me into your family and into your kingdom. And my life is yours. Lord, I'm laying down my life now. I die to every ambition I've ever had for myself, and I'm going to put my whole trust in you. And that's called being born again. That's called being saved. And that's the greatest deliverance you'll ever have is deliverance because if you don't have that, you're delivered. You're, you, you're under the bondage of Satan, and, and you're, you're going to just live a life that's far from the purposes and plans of God. But now... If you prayed that prayer with me and you truly believe that in your heart, you confess it with your mouth, so just say it, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my Lord, and then he'll save you and set you free. So, Father, we thank you now. Thank you for nine wonderful years here at the church. And, Lord, the thing you've done over these 460 times we met together, you're doing it here again today. We've worshiped you. We've prayed to you. We've, we've raised funds for missions. We, we, we've asked people to come into the family of God, and they've gotten saved. We believed in deliverance. We've preached the word of God without compromise, and we thank you. Lord, should you tarry, we pray the next 460 be a double portion, God. Lord, let there be a greater glory in the house. We give thanks for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. It was wonderful being with you today. We'll see you again soon.